Thank you, Pastor Paul. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's so good to see you. And you don't know it, but every single person in this room has been prayed for for the last few months. And as, you know, different times I've been woken up in the middle of the night, and God says, oh, change what you planned because there's something else I want you to say or a different story. And I know that God wants us to work together and be vulnerable and no one needs to worry about anything. If you're new to prayer or new to the Holy Spirit, that's okay. If you're really young and have children, welcome. We're so happy. And if you've been married for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, welcome. Because I've been married for 40 years. In a couple weeks, it will be 40 years to my husband. <laughs> Thank you. And we all know, everyone in this room knows that marriage is beautiful. It is a covenant when you stood there with your husband or your wife and you made a promise in this holy covenant. And at that point, you were standing on holy ground and you loved them with all of your heart and you said yes to each other. And that became a holy covenant and choice that you made. And some days we don't feel that way. Maybe half of you don't feel that way today. And maybe the other half feels really great and some people, you know, or some people in the middle. There are days when you feel this deep love and I will look at my husband and think, you amaze me. Your love for the Lord amazes me. God chose you for me. And there are other days when I don't feel that way at all. Isn't that how marriage is? It's so interesting. It's the very next day. It's almost when you spent the best possible time with them. And you said, I love you and everything's great. And maybe you had an Eros moment, which we will talk about later. But an intimate moment and it's all great. And the next day, for some reason, you're just like, who are you? You are so rude. You know, or you're ignoring or something. And don't we do that? And then when I, sometimes I verbalize and sometimes I don't. But even if I think it, I'm asking God immediately. Because I know it's the enemy. And that is spiritual opposition. And the enemy does not want you to have those beautiful moments. Doesn't want you to remember that union. Doesn't want you to be in unity and show that love and forgive over and over, we are always fighting the enemy. We have to remember that. And we have gotten better at saying, oh my gosh, you know, today the enemy is working overtime on us. Let's take a time out. So marriage brings us great joy. It's beautiful. It's a covenant. It's the most important relationship in your life, second to your relationship to God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. That's saying a lot. And it's mentioned in the Bible all the time about the bride and the groom, right? And that relationship is complex. It is hard, hardest relationship we can imagine. But there's joy. There's great joy in pressing in and working toward our relationship, even though it's so very difficult. And through prayer and calling on the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave us. So Jesus, before he left, told his disciples, I'm giving you a helper. And your helper will be living in you, and you have to activate that helper in this marriage on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis. 
sometimes you get those little snippy phone calls or you get, you know, tones that you don't like or I give a tone that I don't like or I don't understand that I'm giving a tone but I'm told I'm giving a tone. And, and you get that every day. And we have to be able to laugh about it. We have to laugh about it. It's okay to laugh about it. So, 40 years, guys, 40 years. And, um, and it's beautiful and it's better than it could ever be. And I choose my husband over and over again. And I cannot tell you how far from perfect I am. And my marriage is not perfect. I mean, he mentioned, oh, my husband's an elder. No, he does not have a halo. <laughs> and no, I do not either. And it's okay. And things get messy, but don't give I am the result of um, two parents who divorced when I was four and they had three marriages and three divorces. Okay, so I saw firsthand that it doesn't matter, every marriage is hard, keep bringing the same old things back into each one, but I had a God-fearing grandma and grandpa on both sides. My Italian grandparents, and my lovely um, grandma, they're French and Irish, but um, my grandma raised me most of the time. And my two grandmas would kneel at the bed in prayer together over their children. And so prayer is powerful. So let me tell you about, so we have nine grandchildren. We have three children, they're grown, and um, nine children, nine grandchildren all together will be ten soon. And um, I'm telling you, I love them so deeply. And my daughter-in-law, who lives here locally, and they have four kids, <laughs> but her first year of marriage, we we were in the car together, and she said, "Man, marriage is so hard. It's such a struggle." And this, at this point, I had only been married 29 years, and she felt like that you could have said 100. And um, and she said, "It must be so great, just not." fight each, with each other, not know, you know, worry about knowing each other, just don't struggle anymore. And I said, what? <laughs> I just looked at her, I said, are you kidding me? Do you know what comes now? Every time we have an argument, and I say, for 29 years, <laughs> I have been saying this. Okay, so you understand, but you know what? It gets better and better and better and richer and richer and richer. And every argument, if you call on God, it can be a fruit-giving argument. So again, marriage is a covenant. And we need to be thankful for the spouse that has been given to us. And let them know we're thankful and not let an en the enemy get a stronghold. I'm sorry, I forgot about this little clicker. Let's see here. So today, we're asking the Holy Spirit to draw you deeper in love with each other and with the Lord. You've heard of the triangle. God's at the top. The closer you get to him, just like Pastor Paul was saying, the closer you get to each other. Pray continually. The Bible says, without ceasing, never stop. And with thanksgiving in all circumstances. I thank you, God. I thank you that you got us through this morning, we got to church, we're still sitting next to each other, everything's going to be okay. Continually choose love, demonstrate unity, being a team, that is key, and forgive freely. We're going to address those things today, but first we have to talk about the role of a whole, the Holy Spirit in marriage and so I'm going to read these verses to you. Isaiah 11:2, And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. All of those things available to us in our heart, a gift from Jesus, call on the Holy Spirit, and we receive these things. Healing. If you're not comfortable with prayer, say, God, please help. Help. The Holy Spirit, God knows everything we're thinking. Everything. So you can say, please help. You know everything, God, please just work this out. You know how to work this out. Please help. Please heal. I talk to God just the same way I talk to you. 
more reverent. But I do tell jokes like, oh, that was very funny, Lord, that you just did that, because he has a good sense of humor. Ezekiel 36, 27 to 29, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. Anybody have a heart of stone today? And give you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Let's give up our hearts of stone. Let's let the Holy Spirit move us today to transform us, to make us different. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. If we're all doing that, our marriages are going to be stronger and stronger. We have to be accountable to this. And then Romans 5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame in our marriages. We have hope no matter what. Never give up hope because God's love has been poured into our hearts continually. And through his love, we can love each other through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. And the role of prayer... I love this because we have to just call out to God really quickly and sometimes every hour. Psalm 138.3, on the day I called you, answered me. My strength of soul you increased. My soul was strengthened by just calling out to the Lord. Rejoice in hope, Romans 12.12. 12. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer again. And never forget that. Just praying, calling out to him. The Lord will be there. Colossians 4.2. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. So these promises and verses and everything I'm saying about the spirit and prayer is the over, think of an umbrella, the overarching umbrella that should always be covering you and your husband you and your wife. I want to pray for us before we move on from here. Holy Father, we just, um, we ask you to send your spirit and your presence among us, that you would make our hearts of stone melt away, that we would feel and hear everything you, Lord, not me, but everything you want them to hear. That we wouldn't ferociously write notes, we can send those later, but just to hear and sit in your presence, God. You are holy, and you are building our marriages. And we pray that you would take away our mindsets, our habits that you don't want us to have anymore. That the enemy's lies have made us believe, Lord. We just pray, God, that you would take those things away. You give us great joy, that we would enjoy this time together, God, and that we would just take a big breath and be vulnerable with each other. And we just thank you, Lord. We love you with all of our hearts, souls, and minds. Help us to love our spouse. God bless you. Help us to love our spouse as as you want us to love them, see them through your eyes, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So choosing love because he first loves us. And that's the most important thing we can do is love. It's the most important commandment. And then loving our spouses. And I can't do this alone without God. I cannot do this alone without him. I don't think you can either. After 40 years, I recognize that I need him more and more every day. But I love my husband 40 times 100 more than I did the day I married him. And because it's a holy covenant, even though he makes me so mad sometimes, it's one of those things that does bring me to tears really easily. Because I know God chose him for me and me for him, and we sharpen each other. 
your spouse sharpens you. They have to exhort you. Who else is going to? They have to be honest with you, and we don't like looking at ourselves. I want to say my husband and I are quite different people. We have very different perspectives. And um, I have a perspective story that I will share with you that happened recently. And I'm sharing it because it, this argument brought a lot of fruit for us. So we unfortunately have a lot of reoccurring arguments. How many of you have reoccurring arguments in your marriage? Why do they keep coming back? But the enemy just the enemy just does that, right? So there's something that, and I'm gonna say XYZ for some of these things so that I don't get into like too much dirt, but but basically there's this thing that I want done outside and I don't have the strength to do it by myself, but it does need to be done, and it's good for both of us that this is done, and it has to be done every week. And so I um, asked my husband a few weeks ago to do this, and he was watching the game. It was like Thursday night. He was exhausted, and he... Um, and so he's watching a game, and we don't have... Well, we have a lot of grandkids, but we don't have kids home anymore, so, you know, I could have waited. I didn't need to bring it up right then, but I did need to do it. I don't know why. So I brought up, could you do X, Y, Z? And he didn't respond. So, of course, my next comment was, had tone, right? It had tone to it. And then he snapped back and said, you know, it doesn't have to be done right now. And I didn't even hear you. Like, why did you not answer me? I didn't hear you. And so I say, I had a decision to make. And at that point, that time, I don't do this every time, but that time I said, okay, God, I'm just going to walk away. I know he's so tired. I know he worked three jobs today. I'm going to walk away. And I went to the kitchen for a while. And I'm like, Lord, help me to not be mad. Help me to, I'm praying lately to be slow to anger. I, I'm only fast to anger with him. Nobody else. No one. Not our kids. No one. Just him. And so, um, so I said, you know, I, and I, I just walked outside. It was dark outside. And the blinds were still up in our family room. And so he's in there. And I went out. And I just said, called out to God. I was looking up at this beautiful dark sky and the stars. And, I, and God just took it away. You know? I took a wait time. And it's like, it didn't have to happen that second. We're both type A people, by the way. We're both, that's a lot. But, but I think that coming in then, I had a great night with him. And I let go of that, you know, I have to have you do this now. So fast forward a couple of days, Saturday morning, and I'm outside, and we love to hike together. It's, you know, I highly recommend find a hobby together, but hiking, and we love it, and we love to be in nature. And so on that Saturday morning, I'm outside, and I see him look out the window, and I'm outside trying to do this thing. And he just, he doesn't come out. So I go in and I ask him to, but again, my tone, and so we kind of, I hashed it out with them big time because I didn't the time before, but I felt like I had to this time. And I didn't have to, by the way. And um, so it's really important for us to stop and kind of realize what we're doing when we are coming down hard on our spouses. A lot of you have like very different perspectives in that one is type A and one isn't. And I think that's even harder. Um, but God chose your mate. So typically he won't walk with me after an argument on a Saturday morning. I'm just being vulnerable because he knows I'm going to bring it up again during the walk. And that's just not very fun for him. <laughs> and so um, I, you know, we hashed it out and it was fine. And this one day he said, um, he was getting ready, and I said, are you going to go on the trail? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I didn't think you'd want to walk with me. And he said, yes, Tammy, I want to walk with you. And I said, well, you know I'm going to bring this up because I want to tell you this. And he said, okay, if we don't talk about it the whole time, it's fine. Long story short, 
and this is too long, I'm so sorry. I timed it and I bet I'm going over, but, um, but I think that, you know, for the first time he really listened to my perspective. And that listening to my perspective, I kid you not, I think it's not going to be a reoccurring issue anymore. And he said, I, you know, if I had that perspective, if I felt the way you did and your perspective just now, I would have been mad too. And I said, exactly. <laughs> and then he said, but Tammy, let me tell you my perspective. And I really listened. And he gave me this perspective, and I, it was hard to believe, because I saw him look out the window, but he did not see me, okay? <laughs> so, you have to believe, and I mean it, he really didn't, I really believed he didn't, but it was hard for me to accept. So you get it, you get it, the perspectives. And then I said, okay, if I had your perspective, I would have been confused. Why is she upset at me? Okay, so we came up with a really good plan to kind of meld those two things together and what, like an if then. Okay, if this happens again, this is what we're going to do and we understood each other. It was life changing. That is sacrifice, the agape love that Tim talked about that is a selfless, selfless marriage. A selfless love, agape. A self-sacrificing love that Tim talked about weeks ago and again this morning. And he also talked about love. And so that is, C.S. Lewis says it's the highest form of love. And I wonder why. If you look at, like I, we gave to each other. We sacrificed for each other. Problem solved, and that is one of our triggers. I call reoccurring arguments triggers because they get triggered so quickly. And so, Eris love, everybody knows what Eris love is, right? It is the passionate love. That feeling you had with your mate when you were first getting together, when you were engaged, you couldn't wait, you wanted to be with them every second. Well, that is very important. But, and that is still important 40 years later. It's all important. But I will tell you what, it is sacrificial love, agape love, that is the most important and which leads to the Eros love. The more sacrifice you have for each other, the closer and more intimate and in unity and the more forgiveness that you will, that Eros love follows. I promise, it does. And so, something really that's important to think about. Let's see. I'm sorry that I'm not like great at these the slide things. Sorry. Um, another trick is to keep when you're doing something for your husband or wife to replace their name with Jesus. Like do it unto Jesus. Whatever you're doing. If you have children, everything you do every day, do it unto Jesus. I am changing this diaper for Jesus. I am making this, you know, picking up these toys for the 15th millionth time this week. I am, you know, I'm doing the joy stealing homework with my children. That kind of thing. Replace it with, I'm doing it unto the Lord. It is a mission. It's a mission. Don't discount it. Every time, I had to learn this the hard way, but every time you sacrifice, you are doing that unto the Lord and your relationship bonds. And don't think I didn't want to bail a million times because of my two parents. And we had to constantly pray for a break of those generational chains of sin. And so if anybody in this room is dealing with that and has experienced that, you have to, with your husband, pray for that breaking. But we made a conscious decision in our marriage that we would never use the word divorce, and in 40 years we have never used it. And we made a conscious decision before we got married that we would never call each other names. And I broke that once. 
and it was my first year of marriage. And he broke it once. And we knew we had said that, so because we made that a covenant and a promise, it made both of us feel so badly we never did it again. <laughs> and so, again, not perfect, we argue, but just set some ground rules in your marriage. All right, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. This is up in my kitchen because it's so important. But I want to read to you Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and it's extended in a really beautiful way. Please just let this wash over you. Holy Spirit, help our hearts to open to know if we need to rededicate some of these definitions of love that you've given to us in your word. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful and is not jealous or envious. It does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive or easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. You're blessed when you let right and truth prevail in your relationship. Love bears all things regardless of what comes, believes all things looking for the best in each other, hopes all things remaining steadfast during difficult times, endures all things without weakening. Love never fails. It never ends. Don't let your love fail. You choose to love your spouse even when you don't feel like it. You choose to love your spouse in the hardest of times. You choose to love your spouse even when your spouse is not loving you back and is not ready to talk to you and has not shown you love in a long time. That may happen and you have to be ready and continue to love, and that is the thing that keep, turns that person back. Let the Holy Spirit and God deal with the heart of, that has turned away. We turn our hearts away from the Lord all the time, but he loves us unconditionally. Don't forget to love unconditionally. And pray. You pray over and over and over again. You pray as much as you can. Okay, so living in unity. Um, question for you, and rhetorical question, but are you living in unity with your spouse, or are you living in your home and living separate lives? It's really easy, surprisingly, to live in the same home and live totally separate lives. And my husband and I did that. And there were great implications and complications and consequences to that. So at 27, I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a preemie newborn. And my husband worked for Space Systems, and he traveled to Europe every other week. And the church that I went to had a prayer night on every Sunday night. It was prayer, and you can kneel at the, in the pews or stand or do whatever you want, but it was prayer and worship, and it was beautiful. It was much like our prayer and worship that we have here. And they had care for children. So my husband would leave on a Sunday morning or afternoon and often be gone for a week. And that night I would bring all my kids and I would kneel and face the pew and just call out to God to help me get through another week. And this went on for years. And he would come back and be jet lagged for probably three days, somewhere around there. And poor guy, I mean, he was exhausted. He did not want to discipline our little boys, you know, because he, he missed them. He wanted to love on them and the baby, you know, and all the different things. But you know what? 
I didn't handle it well either because I became the person who did everything. And I, I kind of relished it in some ways. I was suddenly kind of like the mom and the dad and the disciplinarian and all the things. And he was, you know, handling all of the finances and all the hard work and all the travel and all that. And I had tons of hard work. But then we kept coming together and then we would have separate times. But really for quite a few years, we let it go. And therefore we were living what some of you are probably living, separate lives in the same house. And not a verbal thing, We're not even really arguing much with him, just kind of that silent ignorance, okay? And we really have to be careful to not do that. We sought help, and I wish we hadn't let years go by because there were consequences to that, but I am here to tell you that we sought Christian help. It was the best thing that we ever did, and we really learned how to, you know, handle those things, and he had different jobs that didn't take him away as much, but even when he did have to go away, we had tools. And so it's a good thing to remember stories like that. So how to be a team through constant prayer, getting help when you need it. And let's see, okay, that's the right one. Um, getting help when you need it, choosing love and forgiveness. You know, I had to choose love and forgiveness over and over and over. We can get these to you via email, so don't worry about it, but just think about, these, think about these things as I'm speaking them, and some of them will really reign true, and I'm not going to have every one. I made these up based on mentoring many young men and women with my husband. Okay. Tools to increase unity and intimacy. Pray continually for the Holy Spirit to help you see each other through God's eyes. Not your own eyes, God's eyes. Take a breath when angry. Wait time is so important. If I wait five minutes, everybody can wait five minutes. If I wait five minutes, my perspective is quite different. Freely give love, forgiveness, and grace without limit and never let it run out. Notice the little things and big things your spouse does for you. Give respect, gratefulness, appreciation. It makes both men and women feel loved. Both women and men need especially to feel loved, important, validated, and heard. Heard is a big one. <laughs> I didn't even realize how much, how wonderful it was until my husband started hearing me. And how immediately, when he, if he said, I hear what you're saying first, it gives up a whole half hour of arguing. If, if you're mad and someone actually says, I hear what you're saying, it just changes everything. That sometimes you can avoid a whole fight. So women, men need to be trusted. We hear this over and over from men. They want to be trusted and they want to be respected. You might say, well, <laughs> I don't even want to say it, but you might think that that respect is not warranted. You need to do that because that will help your person grow into the man that God wants him to be. He'll know if he if he maybe doesn't deserve all of it, or he'll know, you let the Holy Spirit take care of that. So men need to be trusted and complimented in surprising and special ways. Discuss this with him. Ask him, what makes you feel good? What makes you feel respected and heard? Women, show respect and admiration and appreciation for your husband instead of criticizing or emasculating him, especially around friends and family. But any time, women, I just went with women first. It's not, it doesn't mean anything. It's equal in the end. Women, stop trying to do it all on your own. This is my problem. And instead, 
ask specifically, keyword specifically, ask specifically because men like that, for his help. Doesn't matter if you've had to tell him 20 times. If he, just make it new every time. And if he tells you to stop telling him so many times because he knows, then you know he knows. <laughs> so, look, I have learned these things the hard way. I'm just saying. Okay, so stop trying to do it on your own. Ask for help. Oh, pardon me, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Keep me online. All right, so um, his ideas his expertise, his ideas, and follow through on his input when he empowers, which empowers and encourages him. So if there's any way to help, for example, my husband wanted to help on the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and I thought, no, I don't, it's fine, it's fine. And, um, but I gave it up, I let him do it. And actually he kind of, you know, I did it but he went through it and cleaned it up or something. And I thought, and I said, and I said, you know what? It, it does look better, so thank you for that. He asked if I would go with a lighter background, and I said no, because I like the color. Um, so, let's see. Men, it is incredibly attractive. I cannot emphasize this enough. We all married you guys because you love the Lord. And we were attracted to that. Now, it might not be every single relationship in here, but even here, I'm assuming that if you are here and working on your marriage, that you are a man who really respects your marriage and wants to lean into God. So, if you... I keep, Losing my place, I'm so sorry. So, if you put God first, spend time in God's word, and pray over your family, or pray over your spouse, it's the most attractive thing you can do. And I promise you, Eros love will follow. I promise you. It is, you can't fake that stuff. And it is so important to us as women. And Jesus said, husbands love your wives as, or Jesus, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That is a verse in the Bible. And gave himself up for her. Think about that. That is sacrifice. You have power. Every man in this room, you have power this beautiful legacy, and it goes on and on, generation to generation, you have a role, and it's very important, and it's extremely attractive. Men, doing housework or being present with your children literally attracts her to you so much. These actions make her feel loved. Scan the room. When you come in, if you come home and you've both worked all day, if people with kids, you know, it's an incredibly hard job. And then some of you work outside, both of you, whatever your situation is, it's an equal playing field when you come home. Now, you have to come up with rules, which you can work on, but it's very important for you to make the effort to say, okay, my job doesn't just end, and then my wife keeps working until the kids go to bed. And you can, it's different for everybody, but it's important. And again, these actions make her feel so loved. And heiress love follows. Men, it doesn't take a lot to make your wife feel loved. Really. It doesn't. There's little things you can do to respect her to make her feel good, to know that you are the most important woman in the world to her. That is a very important thing. 
Women need to feel that love and feel validated. That's very important, as important as the trust and respect. But we all need to love each other in our marriages. Um, so now we're going to move into forgiveness. And you have to have staying power. You have a choice to make every day, sometimes every hour. How am I going to respond? Am I going to forgive? It's so important, these verses. But before I tell you the verses, I'm going to tell you a story. And um, I have a friend that I grew up with at, at church. And this is a forgiveness story. So she is married with four children. She had an affair with the pastor of a church. And when they were found out, um, it was a betrayal for our whole church. It was a betrayal for her husband and four kids. The families, you can only imagine how painful that was. And what happened was that, of course, the pastor never came back into the church when that was found out. But she had grown up in that church. And her father was one of the elders. And we had a healing forgiveness service on a Sunday night, those ones I told you about. And she went up, and I, she has always told me, I can tell this story as long as I want, but every time I envision this, it's just unbelievable. But there her husband is in the front row, and her four children, a couple of them in high school, and she asked for forgiveness to the whole community. And you have to respect that. Any of us would shudder at that. And they asked, come up, come around her, pray over her, whatever you want. So we all went up and we're praying. And she's, you know, bawling and broken. Broken mom, broken. The enemy can get into anything. And especially the things that are powerful, the marriages that are powerful. And she told me later, I didn't even see this because I was in the crowd of people praying over her. And this adorable, petite, beautiful elderly woman just starts making her way through this crowd. And she's just saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And people are trying to move out of the way, frail. She goes up to my friend who's just sobbing. And she takes her hand. And she puts a stone in it. And she said, I will not throw the first stone. And guys, my friend still has that stone today. I think that's not the most important possession she has. So her husband forgave her. Her kids forgave her. She has probably 20 grandchildren, many who are wanting to be missionaries and pastors. She has four children who are serving the Lord, and they are the most on-fire couple. On fire. And what the enemy meant for evil, Jesus turned into beauty into beauty, brokenness into beauty. If he forgave his wife, it took years of counseling, years. And they moved to Sacramento and she said, Satan's such a liar. She loved the beach so much. But they flourished because of forgiveness. And at all my marriage, I have you I have, how can I not forgive my husband for anything? Because I have that example, and I want to give you that example. So imagine you're holding a stone right now for your spouse. Imagine it. Some of you need to really forgive and 
go home and pick up a stone and give it to your spouse and say, I forgive this. I'm going to lay it down for good and not bring it up for the rest of our marriage. I had to do that about all those years alone. I had to do that for my husband. And beauty came from this. Beauty can come and will come if you let it. So David said in Psalm 51, 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. What, could, what would we do without the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God to hold on to? We need him. Almost, almost finished. So, marriage is the greatest instrument of sanctification. Think about this. How would you ever learn unconditional love if you were married to someone who met all the conditions? How would you ever learn mercy, patience, long-suffering, heartfelt compassion if you were married to someone who never failed you? Someone who is never difficult with you? Someone who never sinned against you? How would you ever learn unconditional love, patience, and mercy if you were married to someone who is never slow to acknowledge their sin? or ask for forgiveness. We have to be long-suffering. How would you ever learn grace to pour out your favor on someone who did not deserve it if you were married to someone who was always deserving of all good things? We can't expect each other to be perfect. We're human. But if both people are trying and praying, you will have a marriage that you are so thankful for. And God wants everyone in this room to have a blessed and anointed marriage. It won't be perfect and you will fight. Make your fights good so that fruit comes from them. That they don't become recurring. The main purpose of marriage is that through it, both of you become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ both of you become the people God made you to be to fulfill your mission together in life. Your mission. You have a mission together in life. <coughs> Holy Father, um, we just pray that every part of what we've heard today steeps into our hearts and souls. Help us, God, to just um, give those stones away, to have great conversations in our tables. Ch help them to choose the question, the one question that they want to work on over the next week. I pray for every marriage, God, that you would heal every heart in this room, that you would take away hearts of stone, take away my heart of stone, heal my heart. It is a process. We thank you and praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So, thank you. So, so before you start your group work, I just want you to listen to this. You can close your eyes if you want. But imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed to be done. And so you were not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one that you thought of. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace, and he intends to come and live in it himself. Thank you so much today for letting me have this time together. And we will I will put the questions up, but you each have questions in front of you. And please only 
choose one, like what you think God is really telling you as a couple to work on, but you're only going to spend five or ten minutes choosing. And then you'll be in a whole group discussion with your group leaders. So five, to five minutes even to choose something with your mate. And then um, the rest of the time, your leaders will lead you. Thank you so much, and God bless you.